you know, I think the purpose and the cause is kind of the, the end tunnel at the end of a long road. And the mm-hmm. mission is kind of the road, right? It's, it's what drives you towards what you're trying to achieve. You know, without a vision or a mission, you either slow down or, or you don't really buy into what it is that you're eventually wanting to get out of life, career, family, whatever it is. And so I would kind of say mission and vision is kind of what is propelling you on that road towards what you eventually want to get out of your life. Yeah. The, the more succinct and the better you can buy in, engage into your mission, the, the quicker it is that you're able to go on the road, right? And, and typically in life, when we when we fall victim to things that we have no control over, for one, it makes us feel good because because we feel justified in feeling victimized. But but the the hard reality is is it doesn't move us towards anything beneficial. Mm. It's like we're we're literally just stuck. And so even if you're in a situation that's outside of your control, that might not be beneficial, you can still find positives in taking time to self-reflect. I've been reading a lot of books. I've been kind of digging into things that when it was a thousand miles an hour, I didn't feel like we're top of my list, but now have all of a sudden become important to me again. Carl McGowan was my coach at BYU. He's a legendary coach. He used to tell us all the time in practice, like before practice, he would say, guys, if we're going to be here, we might as well be here. Meaning, look, if you guys are going to dedicate, if I'm going to dedicate myself to honing my craft and being the best that I can, practice is the best place to do that. And so I'm going to take advantage of every opportunity to do that. And so I would come into practice with two mentalities almost every day. And I think if you talk to guys that I played with, I hopefully this rubbed off on a one hyper competitive. I just hated to lose any drill we were in, whatever I can do to win. That's what I was going to do. And then the second thing that I was going to do was going to have a ton of fun. I'm going to crack jokes. You know, if someone gets hit in the face, I'm getting right in their face and I'm telling them six pack and, you know, guys fall down. We're laughing. We're joking. Anything we can do to try to break up the monotony of every single day, kind of doing the same thing, but being able to do that in a way that continued to perpetuate fun to me was a way to kind of just alleviate a little bit of the tension of what we were trying to do. So when you think about you're on a long airplane flight, you know, a lot of people get a little mentally kind of anxious because they're like, oh my gosh, I've got 12 hours left still. And we've been on the plane for two hours and it feels like forever. I always go to that same mentality of, you know, eventually the plane will land and we'll be walking off the plane. So I just got (laughs) to continue to think that this, this too shall pass. It's just going to, it's going to take a little while, but you can kind of get yourself into a mental mindset that eventually it's going to be over. You know, when he was a young player and having to deal with practice and coaches, and uh, I want to hear from Reed on what his thoughts were when, you know, he wasn't the main guy on the team anymore and, and how he went about continuing to motivate himself to be the best, even though maybe he wasn't the star anymore. Um, because the, the, the fact of the matter is, is eventually everybody gets to those points in their career and to be able to know how to handle it and, and, and be able to hear from the people that I actually live that, I think is incredibly important. And so those were kind of the, the reasons why I wanted to tap into those guys. And Hugh McCutcheon as well, who I had on the show too, which is just, he's just a genius in regards to how he can get the best out of his players. Um, I wanted to know what that looked like for him. How, how, yeah. does, he, how does he do that effectively? Because... You know, those are the types of things that I want to be myself. I want to know how to get the best out of the people that I'm leading or serving. For sure. And if I can, if I can go to the, to the masters, then, then you would be ridiculous not, not to try to tap into those, that, that, that expertise. And so in the business world, management development, leadership development is such a massive thing for companies because, because they recognize that the number one reason people leave their job is because of their manager. <laughs> and so, and, and you, you, if you, if you read any business article or the Harvard business review or anything, everyone will say there's a talent war out there right now where companies are, are, are almost 100% of the time focused on how to re, uh, attract the best talent and then how to retain that talent over mm. time. And, and, and if the number one reason why people leave their jobs is because of their manager, 
then if I'm a business leader, I'm putting a ton of emphasis into ensuring that our managers are good managers so that people aren't leaving and that we can retain our best talent. All of those things, those kind of emotional intelligence types of aspects that leaders have really are what define good leaders versus um, poor leaders or great leaders versus just kind of okay leaders. And, um, and it becomes critically important to understand the difference. And so um, that's awesome. After a while, the imposter syndrome tends to go away because you start developing yourself into mastery. And then when you can consider yourself into that mastery zone, then of course, you're no longer consider yourself as an imposter. So the most interesting people that I find are the ones that have the biggest delta, meaning they started from someplace and they've ended someplace else that's extraordinary or, or really interesting. And, and, and then it becomes, tell me about how you did that. Mm. Right? right? Because, you know, it's, it's the story of somebody being a gifted athlete and then becoming a gifted athlete and then being an athlete is not quite as interesting as Michael Jordan, who got cut from the, the, the basketball team to becoming the greatest of all time. What happens is if you're focusing on what you want to see grow, what are you no longer focusing on? You're right. focusing on the things that are actually holding you back which is kind of what we do as humans. We tend to, we tend to, to focus more intently on the critical things that are happening versus the things that can actually benefit us and continue to move us forward in our journey. And so if we're watering what we want to see grow and we're no longer watering or fertilizing the things that are holding us back, eventually those things die. And then over here, you've got this really lush garden. Mm. Right. And then now, now I get to enjoy the fruits of this really well tender tended to garden. I love and that. So yeah, look, look for those areas. What do you want to, what do you want to see grow? Go water, go water the heck out of it. Yeah. And then, and then choke out all the other stuff. Uh, after we won gold against Brazil, NBC's kind of right on him, you know, with the camera and he's congratulating this coaching staff. But then, then he realizes that he needs to take a little bit of a moment. So he's, he kind of walks back and you can see him kind of go into like one of the media tunnels thinking that he's alone. But of course, NBC is like just right in on him and he's just immediately, he's just breaking down because he's just like, I don't know how to handle this from an emotional standpoint. Wow. And um, you could see just the anguish. I've never been able to articulate what it looks like to be in an extreme high but also to be in an extreme low at the same time. Mm. And, and that's what that was for him. And um, it was just, it was a really interesting time, but an amazing story of tragedy, overcoming tragedy, coming together as a team and a group and executing on a plan that Hugh had a course that he had set us on throughout that entire four years since the last Olympics. So the Navy SEAL captain says, um, under times of difficulty or times of stress, we don't rise to the occasion. You know, normally people say, oh, wow, like you had a tragedy. You really rose to the occasion that time. This Navy SEAL captain says, no, under times of stress, we don't rise to the occasion. We sink to the level of our training. That's why we train so hard. Wow. And I thought that's, that's the description of what that, those two weeks in Beijing were for us. I remember multiple times during that, the four years up to the Olympics, we call quad. So up to the, in that quad, when Hugh took over as coach, there were multiple times when he would just flat out say, Hey guys, we're going to be the Olympic champions. And we, we all as players, you think to yourself, well, yeah, of course I want to be Olympic champion, but rarely would we say it mm. because then it was like, it was out there. Right. And you're, you're almost like, um, you're almost jinxing yourself a little bit. Right. But what I valued about Hugh was his extreme confidence that in, in the plan, right, that he was he was going to stick to, that he had confidence in, that we were going to be Olympic champions. We were going to be the best team in the world at the end. And um, I think back on that now, and it instilled this confidence in us to come in every day and, and live our mission statement. And, and, and train like the best team in the world, even though we might not go out and win the World Cup or, you know, do really well in world championships. But in the end, this all of this work is going to be leading somewhere. And it's to the to, to the place where we all wanted to be, you know, we didn't want to go out and be World Cup champions. 
we didn't we didn't necessarily I mean yeah it would have been great to have won world championships but that's not what we wanted we wanted to win the Olympic Games and and um, I think his ability to instill that that motivation and confidence in us every day by saying those things out loud I think was critical to me success is respecting the journey because look Beijing was fantastic it was my third Olympic Games hadn't won a medal the other games um, so people are like, well, you define success by winning the gold medal. And I said, no, the gold medal was simply in the end outcome of a very long journey. And, you know, underperforming in 2000 in Sydney, missing out on the bronze medal in 2004 in Athens, like all of those were steps in the journey that allowed us to get to where we needed to be in, in Beijing. And so I feel like success is really respecting the journey that you're on. And then success ends up being the outcome. The real success is figuring out what you can learn in those failure points that allows you to be successful the next time. So that's how I look at failure. I'm, I'm very methodical around um, getting done what I need to get done in a timely manner so that I can have time to uh, have a balance for my mental sanity. You know, as a consultant, we do a lot of work, especially nowadays via Zoom, over the phone, email. So I pride myself on having a very small amount of unopened messages in my inbox because I just feel like it alleviates this, the anxiousness that I would have because I've had colleagues that I'll look at their phone and they'll have, you know, 27,000 emails in their <laughs> inbox. I couldn't do that. I don't know right. if I'm OCD about that. I could be, but if I have more than 10, it, I'm like, I get like jittery. It starts freaking me out because I feel like I'm going to miss something. And so I feel like I've got, I've got a really good work ethic around getting things done in the moment they need to get done versus, you know, putting them off. And I think that's, you know, it's been fairly successful for me up to this point. So, you know, I, I came up with a slogan that a lot of people, it takes a while to understand, but I say, you're only as short as you sell yourself. So never sell yourself short. Like that. And so it's kind of deep when you think about it, because it's like, to me, it means there's, there's, to me, there's no bigger attribute than having your own self-confidence. And if you're selling yourself short, then you're going to act like you're somebody that needs to be looked at as short, right? And I don't mean short height wise. I'm talking about just your overarching self confident measure. And so to me, the, the taller you can sell yourself to me just means that you've got a, a you've got a high sense of self-confidence, that you've got a high sense of self-value. You know, you can get things done. You know, you can be someone that can be depended on. And so don't sell yourself short. Love that. Know your worth. I think a lot of people would hope that they leave this earth with a lot of people that you've interacted with because every single one of our influences is bigger than we will ever imagine. The reason why I say that is because, you know, you touch every person that you interact with and you never know what that touch point is going to eventually do for that person, which potentially could touch another person and another person. The ripple effect in our own individual influence to me is greatly understated. And oftentimes we don't ever really think about how influential our influence is on other people that we come in contact with. And so I hope that at the end of my life, people will think that, I, you know, I was a good person. I, I tried to do the right thing. I worked hard and I was somebody that they could depend on and, uh, and someone that they wanted that, that was loyal and, and, and a person that, that they felt like, look, I, I'm, I'm grateful for knowing that person. And so, you know, th those are the types of things that I hope people think about when I'm, you know, gone in a way. This episode is brought to you by West Coast Beach, a year round beach volleyball club on the west side of Los Angeles in Santa Monica, California. At West Coast Beach, we aim to get 1% better every day, both on and off the court. You can find more info about us at westcoastvbc.com and on Instagram with handle at westcoastvbc.